IMSA's top category, the GTPs, or LMDHs, or DPI 2.0, or SAV, Simply Awesome Vehicles, or whoever you want to call them, is already looking like a ginormous success. However, it's important not to forget what a success the prototype class preceding it was as well. Some awesome looking cars, which produce amazing racing. Arguably some of the best sports car racing that there's ever been. Another advantage that this formula had was that customer teams were just as competitive as the main manufacturer backed efforts, with equally competent drivers behind the wheel. That doesn't mean that every team though, was a success. Home cost racing. Whilst I won't go into detail about the team's history, as I plan to save that for another video, the team had been rather victorious in the Road to Indy ladder system, and had entered into the IndyCar series for the first time in 2018 with a mix of drivers. Now the team weren't loaded with cash, hence why the team enlisted some pay drivers to help with the funding of this programme. That though didn't stop them from making a heavy investment of a Cadillac DPI automobile, to compete in the 2019 IMS of Willatex Sports Car Championship. This had been planned for some time. Team principal Ricardo Huncos was enthusiastic about the idea of having a top level prototype program as part of the team. Our entry into the top class of the IMS of Willatex Sports Car Championship represents a significant step forward for our company. Cadillac has a proven history of winning and performance within IMSA and provides Huncos Racing with a championship caliber partner to begin its entry into DPI. Huncos went to the Road America round of IMSA in 2018 to explore potential opportunities in either LMP3, GT4 or GT3. However, after meeting Cadillac representatives, a DPI program was put into action. So the driver announcements were revealed gradually over time. For the full season campaign, Will Owen, a driver with previous connections to Huncos in the Pro Master series, but prior to this had been racing for LMP2 stalwarts United Autosports over in Europe. Carl Kaiser, another Huncos graduate who was making IndyCar starts for the team in 2018, was then announced for the Daytona 24 hours. Next up, Rene Binder, who drove for the team in IndyCar for 2018 also, who would compete in all four Michelin Endurance Cup rounds for the team, with the final driver later being named Agustin Canapino, who had the exact opposite career trajectory in that he now races for Huncos in IndyCar four years after his stint with them in IMSA. In Canapino's case, he said, I will give my 100% every time I am behind the wheel of the Cadillac DPI, and I am very excited to have the chance to race in one of the biggest races in the world. So the lineup for the first race of the season was set, but the full season lineup prior to the Daytona 24 hours hadn't been set in stone yet. In fact, a decision on who would partner up Will for the remainder of the season still hadn't been decided before the Sebring 12 hours at the next round, although that's something which I'll provide further clarity on as we progress through the season. It is perhaps important to note that the Huncos team had not done any sort of racing like this whatsoever up to this point. Nothing in the LMP2, GTLM or GTD categories, or even the divisions below the Wenatec series such as the Michelin Pilot Challenge, so to expect them to be aiming for victories is wholly unrealistic during the season. However, the DPI class certainly had the capability of throwing up a surprise. The typical kickstart for the championship of Daytona initially yielded some good speed. Canapino, though, was a revelation. Coming from a career of Argentinian touring car supremacy, it would have been understandable if he took the longest to get acclimatised to the Cadillac DPI car, which is exactly what didn't happen. Transition? What transition? Agustin showed some great performance, even being the one designated to qualify the car. An impressive time as well, being within a second of the pole time set by Oliver Jarvis. Unfortunately though, they wouldn't be starting from the 7th position. After starting from the pit lane with a throttle problem, the car would suffer irritating gremlins with the electronics, with the car grinding to a complete halt with Owen at the wheel just before the completion of the 4th hour. After losing 30 laps, the car would suffer a different kind of problem, just over 10 hours gone and the Huncos team gave us the Cadillac DPI VR Tricycle Edition. Still in the early development stages though it looks like. Now nearly 40 laps down on the leader and well out of contention, the car had a couple of off-track excursions in the wet conditions. Although to be fair, so did pretty much everybody else. 
The race ended under the red flag, with the team finishing 29th overall, 8th in DPI, 38 laps down. Very much a learning experience for the team, with Owen saying from the adventure, I'm relaxed. A lot more relaxed. We just feel like we've done it all once. We had some mistakes, and that's expected, and it's okay. But now we know each other, how we work, and know what to improve. Sebring was another disappointing outing for Hunkos, although once again it wasn't of its own making. After a couple of hours of solid running, a piece of debris cut the alternator belt, which forced Rene Binder to go behind the wall, and in turn led to him and his teammates Willow and Augustin Canapino finishing 43 laps down, second to last in the DPI class. We then head to the first round of the season where only two drivers are necessary. Will Owen was there for the full season, and Carl Kaiser would be for Long Beach. However, the team at this point was still trying to find a full season driver with the required funding. Kaiser would qualify the car, 1.3 seconds behind the pole time. There was though some good news to come from this race. A far more competitive outing where the team, through a great strategy call, would end the race having led 14 laps and were in a healthy 6th place with 6 minutes remaining, until a late braking move by the 31 Action Express Cadillac put Owen offline and into the wall. They would get going though and finish 7th, one lap down. A turning point potentially? Well Owen certainly thought so. We're definitely very happy about that, and we can sit back and know we did good work. Now we just have to push harder to keep this momentum up for Mid-Ohio. A teammate for Mid-Ohio still wasn't confirmed at that point, but it would later turn out to be Carl Kaiser once again. Mid-Ohio was a very quiet affair for Hunkos. Owen qualified 2.6 seconds off the pole time, and in the race, they would calmly go about things with a modest ninth place, one lap down to the winner. For the next race in Belle Isle, Owen would be joined by someone else. A completely new face to the Cadillac, but not to the team. Brazilian driver Victor Franzoni drove with Hunkos the year prior in the Indy Light series and won the 2017 Pro Master Championship with the team. However, his endurance racing experience was somewhat limited, albeit did make a start earlier in the year for Via Italia racing in the GDD class Ferrari at Daytona. Franzoni said, I'm super excited to be back with Hunkos Racing and be a part of their Cadillac DPI VR program. I am looking forward to working with Will Owen since he has a lot of experience with this type of car, and this will be my first time in this type of car. We will work hard and look for a great result in Detroit. Franzoni was tasked with qualifying the car and did a pretty good job in my view, just over 1.7 seconds off pole. After a competitive first 30 minutes though, Franzoni hit the tyre barrier and damaged the rear bodywork of the Cadillac. Despite that, the car would still finish on the lead lap in 8th place. For Watkins Glen, there is the option of either having two or three drivers for the iconic six hour sprint. In the end, Hunkos would have two, that being Will Owen and Rene Binder. However, rumours were going around that a third driver was close to being given the go ahead, with that driver supposedly being Alex Brundle. With that not happening, the team continued with its two drivers and had a fairly nondescript event, qualifying under three and a half seconds off pole and finishing five laps down. 8th in class. For Mossport, Victor Franzoni was back alongside Will Owen, who would qualify the car 1.8 seconds off the pole time. Another uneventful race seemed to be in progress, until the race had under 35 minutes left to go. Coming into turn 2, Franzoni suffered a monstrous crash in the Cadillac, demolishing the tyre barriers and submerging the car into said tyre bundles on its side. Luckily, despite being sent to hospital, along with being in a fair amount of discomfort, Victor would not suffer any serious injuries from the accident. The car looked as though it stood up well to the impact, but it was ultimately a complete write-off, with the new chassis having to be utilised. The team's aim was to be back by the round at Road America, but that came and went. So did Virginia, although that's okay because so were the other DPIs. Laguna Seca was also skipped, but luckily Hungos would get the car ready for the final round at the Petit Le Mans. Although in reality, the team had gotten the car ready for Road America, but weren't able to find a second driver. Meanwhile, a new driver would take the cockpit of the Cadillac. Another one of Hunkos' former single-seater protégés, Spencer Piggott, would join Will Owen and Rene Binder. Piggott said, I'm really looking forward to joining Hunkos Racing again, this time for Petit Le Mans. We've had success together in different championships, 
and I hope we can continue that in IMSA. The team had apparently contacted Toyota LMP1 driver Jose Maria Lopez about the additional seat, but scheduling conflicts were too great of a factor. Piggott though would qualify the car and be just over a second off the pole time. The following 10 hours though would potentially prove to be Hunkos' best sign of performance this season. Not that you would know that looking at the final classifications. 22nd overall and 48 laps down isn't the best thing to read. However, the Cadillac showed great speed in the early stages of the race, even climbing to as high as third. It would end up losing around an hour of track time due to a power steering failure. With the season over, the championship standings showed Hunkos finishing in last place. Perhaps not surprising given how it didn't participate in two rounds, but disappointing nonetheless. Looking back on the season, Ricardo Hunkos had this to say. For me, this year was a big learning process. Everything was new, 100%. I think we did a good job recovering from situations. And as for what the 2020 prospects were, we can do Daytona only? Maybe the full season? Maybe the endurance races? Basically, everything was on the table. Well, I say everything, but maybe not quite everything was on the table as what ultimately happened was no races and the complete sale of the Cadillac to Chip Ganassi Racing, which it would campaign successfully in the 2021 season. If I'm being completely honest, this program just felt like a huge task for a team that weren't quite ready to tackle the program properly. There's a good number of factors as to why I think this. Firstly, the team's experience when it came to endurance racing prior to this season was practically zero. They hadn't done a year of Michelin Pilot Challenge, a campaign in a GTD class car or anything like that. They were heading straight in at the deep end. And goodness me, when you're competing with the likes of Penske, Wayne Taylor, Action Express and others, that is a mightily deep end, even in a series like Emza, where even if you have a bad race initially, you are far from out of the equation for a win. Then there was the constant driver rotation. I say that all the drivers who drove the Cadillac were of a good calibre, the issue though was that Paul Will Owen couldn't find a consistent wingman to partner up with for the full season, therefore very little chance to build up any kind of chemistry. That driver roster though was impacted by the budgetary constraints the team seemed to be under. In general, this program came too quickly, too soon, with too big of a transition in my view, to be competitive. Hunkos himself said, It's big. This is intense. This is the top level, so for us, to jump into the full season, we need to have everything right. We didn't this year, and what happened for us was probably a consequence of that. I reckon if the team in its current guise entered IMSA, it would do pretty well, or at least put in a programme that was competent enough to be in at least the middle of the pack on a regular basis. With that though highly unlikely to happen, it's a hypothetical scenario that we shouldn't bonder on for all that much time. That though is going to be it for this video, thank you very much for watching. What did you think about Hunkos' escapade into IMSA? Cool to see them there, or was it just a huge waste of time and money? Say your thoughts in the comment section down below. However, until the next video, be kind to each other and enjoy the rest of your day.